We are coming out of summer, and uh, you know, summer for a lot of people uh, means vacation or taking a break. If you're a student, you probably took a break from school, unless you went to summer school, or maybe you took a break from some projects, or um, took a break from uh, uh, work, a, por- a part of your work or something like that. And um, what I've noticed a lot of times in the summer in, in church life is that in a, maybe unconsciously or unintentionally, uh, sometimes Christians kind of put their faith on hold during the summer, kind of draw back a little bit, take a pause or a vacation from God, which is a bad idea. How many of you think that's a bad idea? And, um, you know, uh, as we're coming out of summer in our city and in our society, um, I just want to take a minute to try to challenge you and encourage you to re-engage your faith. Maybe you've been through some situations in your life that have kind of worn you down or worn you out, maybe some disappointments or, or uh, failures or losses of some kind. Uh, but maybe uh, you've just been through a season of weariness. And I want, I want to say to you that faith works best when it's fully engaged. And so I want to encourage you to get out of the, any kind of summer season of uh, being casual in your faith and really locking in at this next season because I think God has some great things for you. You as an individual, you and I as a church. And so that's what I want this message to be all about. Um, you know, it's possible that there are people here today that need to have their spiritual life revived a little bit, some personal renewal in our journey of faith. And so uh, today, I think it's time that we inspire each other and encourage each other to increase our faith, intensify our faith because of what God has ahead of us. You know, when um, if you've ever been to the doctor's office or even to a hospital, when you go in there, they uh, will test your vitals, your vital signs. And there's like four things that they always do when you go in. Uh, it's not usually the doctor, it's the nurse, but um, they check your uh, temperature, your blood pressure, your breathing, and your pulse. And so... Uh, is that the four things, or did I repeat myself? <laughs> if you're over 50, there's another thing they like to test, but we don't want to get into that, because that's, that's why men don't like to go to the doctor. But when they test the vital signs, and there's something weak or off about one of those vital signs, it gives them an indication of where they might need to look further. And... Um, I believe that there's spiritual vital signs. And if you could think of the church as a um, spiritual health and renewal center, uh, we would be looking at some the spiritual vital signs. And really, I honestly believe what I'm going to talk to you about today is if one of these vital signs spiritually, there's a problem or it's weak. It's an indication of other things in our life. And uh, it's, it's uh, I think, throughout the long journey of faith, uh, we will find ourselves at different times weak in one of these areas. And it doesn't mean that necessarily that you're a bad person and you don't have much faith, but it's one of those uh, pitfalls that we get into. And so today, uh, we're going to check your spiritual vitals. <laughs> um, there's a verse in a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 11 in the Message Bible that I like because of the wording in it, it, they talk about the rhythms of grace. Jesus was talking to a group of people and talking to people who had some weariness, some struggles in their life. And so in uh, Matthew 11, verse 28 in the Message Bible, Jesus says this, are you tired? Are you worn out? burnt out on religion, come to me, get away with me and you'll rediscover or recover your life. 
I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Isn't that cool? And I think no matter how you would describe yourself in your journey of faith as a follower of Christ, this is always something that we need to learn. And to be honest, um, I think sometimes uh, uh, I struggle with this unforced rhythms of grace. Did you just say amen down there, Holly? <laughs> I thought I heard a female amen over on the left. And, uh, but I, I would be the first to admit it. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm forcing things I should not be forcing and trusting God to do. And sometimes I'm not forcing the things that, that I should be getting more intense about. And so learning the unforced rhythms of grace. A few days ago, I was watching this documentary on National Geographic, and it was, it was talking about the orca whale, the killer whale, and it was showing a mom and one of the the young uh, whales and teaching the whale how to fish for, or, um, catch its own food and and so this whale would it showed a beach with these uh, seals and the um, the whale would come up kind of stealth like and then in I don't know what it was like 20 feet it could accelerate from zero to like 50 miles an hour and just go whoosh right under the shore and grab up one of the seals. And the baby or the, the, young, uh, the younger one, uh, not quite a baby, but learning to uh, get its own food was, is watching this. And so then it showed the baby or the, the young whale uh, giving it a try. And so um, this whale just burst into the speed and going for a seal and then it beaches itself accidentally. And they were saying how this happens uh, pretty often because the young ones are learning their strength and learning the dangers. And so while it was doing something normal and that it needed to do to survive, it pushed too far up on the shore and got stuck in the sand. And so uh, there was not enough water high enough in the body for it to be buoyant enough to get out. And so they talked a little bit about the structure of the whale and, and you know, it can't like just go, oh, let me back up. <laughs> and so um, this one, um, you know, wiggled itself free after several minutes and learned an important lesson. But they were saying uh, this was a life-threatening moment in this young whale's life. And I thought about spiritually how sometimes um, we're doing things that are good, but we're, we need to learn this unforced rhythm of grace but we, we burn ourselves out or we go too far or we're trying to learn our strength or our, the power of our words or something. And, and I just like that picture with um, just this journey that we're all on. And so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, vital choices. I'm going to talk to you about the vital signs of a healthy uh, faith. I want to uh, take my uh, message and my points from First Peter. First Peter is an epistle that, that Peter wrote, obviously, and, and we, we like Peter because the Gospels are real faithful to show his weaknesses and his humanity and his failures and his, his arrogance and his boldness and all these different things. But at the end, he is one of the strongest apostles, a core key leader in the church, in the beginning of the church. And so he is writing to them because of the struggles that they're facing. He's writing to them because many of them are at this place of struggle. Do I continue? Do I give up? Is what I believe real? And, and all of the things that people might battle with. And so in 1 Peter 1.13, it says this. Peter says, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. 
so that you must live as God's obedient children. Listen, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. See, because you know better now, but don't go back. And, and so prepare your minds for action. Exercise self-control. Put all your hope in your salvation. And, and he said, keep going and don't pull back. And... Um, I want you to know um, some very simple things is that our faith is ignited when we recognize the value of our salvation and um, the value of God's gift to us, his love for us, the forgiveness that we get by faith, this salvation that we can't earn and we don't deserve. And our human nature, we tend to take things for granted and we get used to things. But I think about the woman who came to Jesus and was sobbing and worshiping and anointing his feet with oil. And the career believers, the Pharisees, are standing around going, wow, she's kind of emotional. And in one story, one of the, the disciples of Jesus goes, man, are you sure you wanted to spend that much money on this oil? That's kind of a waste. But she was so taken by his love and his forgiveness and this great gift. And sometimes when we lose sight of the value of our salvation, we lose intensity, we lose the, vi the vitality of our faith. And uh, <clears throat> in 1 Peter 1.17, it says, you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid in mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. He's saying, oh, just think about what you got through Jesus. It wasn't just silver and gold, which is, will be done away with, but it was the precious blood of the lamb that paid for your forgiveness and your salvation. Is there anybody in here who is grateful to Jesus for what he's given to us? His salvation, our gift, the blessing of God. When we stay engaged with that, it ignites our faith. And our faith is ignited when we recognize that we are chosen and we have a special purpose and assignment. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, he says, you're chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Man, that's one of the struggles that humanity faces and deals with. And some of us, it might be more of a battle than others. But, but we tend to uh, question the calling of God because of the great opportunity and how unworthy we might be for salvation. You know, we start to think, I'm not enough or I don't have enough. You know, you go through life and in some appropriate places, you evaluate people, their potential, if you're going to hire them or if they're part of a team and they have to have the skills or you're evaluating somebody as a, a, a potential mate or spouse. And, and, and when you think spiritually and you evaluate yourself, you're like, I fall short, but I'm telling you, God chose you. And he said, I'm going to use you and show people that even though you might have been in a place of darkness, you went through failures or difficulties or struggles, I'm going to show people through you that you can overcome them and that you can go into the light that God has. That's encouraging to me. If you think about it, if he can, in spite of the failures you've been through or the setbacks you've been through, use you to show his victory. I mean, some of you could have a lot bigger ministries than the rest of us, <laughs> you know, because we've had plenty of failures to, to say, hey, if God could use me, he could use you. But in 1 Peter 2.11, a couple of verses later, he says, um, dear friends, I warn you uh, as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. And so there's this battle in our soul about what we could do and what God wants to do with us. But I want you to know that 
that God has something great, that your salvation is great and he has something uh, important for you. You know, casual devotion is a threat to the quality and intensity of our faith. Casual devotion. It could be the greatest threat of our spiritual vitality. It becomes indifference. You know, casual devotion to anything produces mediocre results. And mediocre results causes people to consider giving up. I think about that again. So casual devotion to anything will give you average or common results, and average or common as mediocre results, and we think, well, maybe it's not worth it. We might think that about our work, our business. We might think about that with an art or a gift. It could be about um, a relationship, and we uh, have a casual devotion to it, and it gets mediocre results, and we're wondering if it's worth it. And so we think about quitting, we think about drawing back rather than upping our devotion, increasing our investment in it. And so maybe that happens to people with our faith. We're putting casual devotion, we do just barely enough, we do what we wanna do and what's convenient for us and then we get mediocre results in the strength of our faith in the um, hearing God's voice and in the victories that we face. And we think, well, I wonder if this is working. I wonder if it's worth it. And we consider drawing back. And I wanna encourage you to um, invest yourself, uh, in, increase these uh, vital signs that we're gonna talk about that will give you a vibrant faith and bring victory. There's a big difference between dabbling in something and being devoted to something. You know, when you start out with stuff, we're always passionate and vibrant, and, and uh, then we start being casual. And, and uh, you know, faith works best when you're devoted. And uh, I want you to know that because you can overcome the problems and challenges that you, you're facing. And so, um, vital choice number one is following God's word. Checking our vital signs include, includes, are you choosing to follow God's word? In 1 Peter 2, 8, he says, they, which are unbelievers, stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you not like that. You are not like that. As, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God and how he called you out of darkness into light. So he puts the focus on the word of God. And so it's important that we follow the word. And in order to follow the word, we have to become familiar, knowledgeable of it. We have to, to have a hunger for it. And Peter's not just talking about believing that the Bible is true, but pursuing it. Getting the ability to grow in our faith. The word of God reveals who he is. The word of God connects us with him. And so sometimes people fall into this routine and we, we feel like we're reading the Bible because we have to, or we're supposed to, or the pastor's teaching about it again, or my friend, I don't want my friends to think I don't care. So, but it's not that. It's people who follow his word find out that there's this unique comfort that comes from the word of God that speaks to us. There is a, a stirring of faith that comes to us like it can come no other way. And so we follow his word because we find out it's what gives us victory. It helps us overcome the enemy. And you might be going through some struggles or battles, but I tell you, somebody who gives themselves to the word of God in reading it and becoming familiar, it builds your faith so that when you go through a difficult time, the word kind of comes up out of your heart or your mind and you're reminded, God said he would never leave me nor forsake me. I don't feel like he's here, but I know he is because the word of God is. When you go through something where your heart is broken, you say, you know, God is the healer of the brokenhearted. And you feel like you're lacking resource and you find out in the word of God, he is our provider. And these things rise up to us and it helps us to interpret the circumstances. 
Come on, give some praise to God. Thank him for his word. There's a uh, research group uh, called the Barna Research Group, and, and they um, do like Gallup uh, polls and surveys with not only in the church world, but other ways. But the Barna Research Organization did a survey and among people who believe the Bible is God's word. And what they found out was interesting because they said 60% of the people who believe the Bible is God's word could not um, name one of the Ten Commandments. 60%. He said one out of three who believe the Bible is God's word couldn't name one of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't have to know the Gospels to have a relationship with Jesus. I mean the names. But it just shows an unfamiliarity with the word if you can't think of them. And then this one, I know it sounds like I'm making it up, but it's true. He said 12% of the people they interviewed thought Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> like Mrs. Arc. That's ridiculous. We know she was a sister. <laughs> I'm kidding. So what do we do about that? How do we increase that vitality in us? I want to encourage you to either create a plan or follow a plan that helps you read the word of God uh, on a regular basis. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need that for our soul. We need it for our spirit, man. We need it for faith. And so you, you might, and if you, you struggle, say, well, I don't really uh, understand something. My Bible's kind of hard to understand. Get a new one. There's lots of translations. The Message Bible, you know, just kind of the Living Bible, the New Living Translation, you know, just kind of puts it so that we can understand it. I'm not suggesting that you have to read hours a day or chapters. It's just reading some. Enough to where you get something where you're going, I, I, this is something for me to be thinking on today or to guide me today or this helps encourage me in my, the things I'm facing. It might even just be something that um, will help you in how to pray because you said, Lord, your word says this, and so I'm praying that for my life. The word of God is so powerful, so important, and it brings us the reassurance and the wisdom um, that we need. Um, the second vital choice is engaging in frequent times of prayer. First Peter 4, 7, he encourages us to be alert and of a sober mind so that we may pray. Prayer is how we commune with God. Prayer is one of the great benefits of our salvation. Jesus came to bridge the disconnect between humanity and God. And so we have access to God, ourselves in the name of Jesus. It's talking to him. It's listening for his leading and his guidance. It's, it's bringing our cares and our worries. It's, it's connecting our friends and family with the grace of God and his strength. We, are, uh, we find out that uh, there are powerful provisions of prayer that are never realized because people just don't pray. So I'm inviting you as part of the Oasis community uh, to join me, join us in 21 days of prayer. So starting today, September 11th to October 1st, I want to invite you to pray. And what I mean by that is that you take a special time I'm not telling you how much or when, but each day. Could be in the morning, could be at lunchtime, it could be any time, but it's taking some time to have a special focus in prayer. So uh, if you rely on praying on the freeway as your prayer life, um, I recommend that, that's good, freeway, but don't use that. Use it as a time where you're not driving, you're not listening, to, you're, you're taking this time to pray. Talk to God. It builds your heart like nothing else will. And so um, we're going to be praying and encouraging each other. 
Find a friend you can pray with if you struggle doing it on your own. Make a phone call uh, at a regular time with somebody that you can pray. And here's what I want to do. I want to help resource you during these 21 days. And so I want to invite you to follow me on social media, on Instagram and Twitter, Philip Wagner LA. And then Facebook is uh, also um, at that address. And what I want to do is I will post scriptures, quotes on prayer, things that we could be praying for. And I want to do a few videos, maybe three minutes long, where I would be praying or encouraging on something to pray with, uh, pray for, because I, I want to c connect with you and, and help us have a successful time together in prayer. And then if you want to unfollow me on day 22, go ahead. I won't take it personal. <laughs> But I'm just trying to um, see what we can do. Now, let me just tell you one thing. One of the things I do is uh, I pray uh, over a list. I have a list of people and circumstances, friends, or uh, I pray for pastors in L.A. by name and churches. Uh, and so I pray for them. And, and so I will just look at this list and pray over a few things on this list. But I have another list, and that's my hit list. And so um, I've got this idea from uh, reading a book about five years ago, and I've been doing it ever since. And so that's like a list of about 10 to 12 people who it's current. It's something that I know them. They've talked to me, and I said, I'm going to put you on my hit list. And so that, that means that I'm going to pray for you every day uh, for the next three weeks or the next month or something. And then as something new comes up, I might move that over to the big list. And I just keep that 12 going. And um, so um, I just have found that something I can really focus in on and helps me uh, keep regular with that. And so what I want to suggest that you might do is um, um, these connect cards we have that um, you can write a prayer request down for yourself or a friend and, and turn it in. We'll be praying. But you may want to either do this at home or take this with you. And I want you to write down, I want you to ask God to show you. And I want you to write down five people that you know in the L.A. area that you could pray for every day for 21 days. And, you know, our vision at Oasis Church is to reach people far from God and lead them to become authentic followers of Christ. That's our vision. And so I wonder if you could get active as one of our, the members of our church community and be praying for five people. Who is it that you could reach out to and bring them to church in, in October? Just like, I'm going to pray for 21 days. I'm going to pray for this person. Pray for the person maybe you work with or pray for a friend or a family member or the, the atheist who said, don't even invite me to church. <laughs> Pray for the Muslim guy who said, I'm not interested. Pray for whoever God puts on your heart, five people. And just pray every day. You might take a scripture that has some kind of promise, put it on there, and just pray over it and just see what God might do. I love it when we can see people make a shift. God has a way of working in circumstances and turning situations around. The number one peop way people come to a church and come to faith is because a friend reached out to them. And so um, make this part of your prayer experience. The vital choice number three, how you doing out there? You know, I want to thank you for giving me feedback. You guys, you guys have been much better than some of the earlier services that still needed their coffee or something <laughs> at 11 a.m. So uh, <laughs> vital choice number three, Love each other deeply. That's the third vital sign, and it's a choice that we make. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all, love each other deeply. It's a calling that we have. The Bible tells us that God is love. Jesus taught love in a new way. This is how people will know that you're my followers if you love one another. And you know what? I, I think that... It's easy to love people at a distance. Love the hurting, love the homeless, love those lost people. Where it gets tricky is when you have to love people that you know. 
Because <laughs> what you probably already know is that in life, one of the greatest sources of joy and happiness are the people that we know, but also one of the greatest sources of pain and heartbreak is the people we know. God says the solution is love. Let love overcome those imperfections, those difficulties. I'm not saying <clears throat> that you have to open yourself up to being taken advantage of or be naive or uh, you know, pursue a relationship with somebody who's abusive or anything like that. But it's just like if you have a friend that there's a breakdown, reach out, forgive, um, just move on with it. Don't, don't ask for an apology. I, know, I can't believe I'm saying that. It's so much easier to love people when they apologize first. That's my standard. But it doesn't qualify under love each other deeply. And uh, I heard this person do an interview on TV, and they said, um, I love people <clears throat> as a species, but as individuals, uh, not that much. And at first I thought, wow, that's kind of weird. But to be honest, I understood what they were saying. Because sometimes it takes work. And you know, some people don't want to get over past hurts or offended, offenses. People get offended. Some, they just want to stay offended. And you know, you can be offended that they're offended at your offense. <clears throat> I don't know if that makes sense. Or you could just love people deeply. And um, you know, what, um, what I've learned over the years is that uh, you can't please everybody, but um, irritating people is a piece of cake. <laughs> so you can offend people and not even know it. So there's this demand on us for your vital signs to be healthy. It takes you taking an extra step, getting beyond it, loving, doing the extra effort to love. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I just uh, finished writing this book that's going to come out in December, and uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Thank you. I'll tell you more about that later. But in the book, I put a quote by William Shakespeare, <laughs> and, and it says, um, I wanted to sound real intelligent, so I quoted William. And it says, love denied blights the soul we owe to God. I like that. Then the publisher, the editor called me and said, William Shakespeare didn't say that. It came from the movie Shakespeare in Love. I'm like, well, I like it anyway, so we're putting it in. I don't care who wrote it, it's not bad. <laughs> So um, at Oasis, one of the important things that we do is getting together in small groups. We call it connect groups. And we have these gatherings three times, three sessions during the year. We just finished the summer session, and in October, we'll start a new one. And we don't do that just to have activities and give you something else to do and keep you busy. But it's one thing to be a part of an audience of people. We have four services. There's some thousands of people that come here. Uh, it's where we can love people as a species, <laughs> or we can get to know individuals. We get together. We pray for each other. We get to know somebody. We let somebody know us. And there's something powerful about when you go through your dark time that somebody that you got to know at a connect group is calling you, texting you, showing up at the hospital, pray, bringing you what you need for help, and, and you can be that person to someone else. So be a part of it. You know, and, and we, uh, Wes mentioned earlier, we're having this um, event coming up at the end of September, Love Works. And it's about building relationships, relationships and marriage, because love works. Lust doesn't work. Manipulation doesn't work, criticism doesn't work, but love works. 
And so we want to put an investment in, in a city where marriages are really s struggling that let's make an investment in how we can practically love each other. And that's what that, this is all about, love each other deeply. Last one, uh, vital choice, is serve others. Serve others. 1 Peter 4, 9, offer, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, you see, the Holy Spirit just likes to push it. Like it's never enough, you know? It's just like, be, show hospitality. I can do that. I can fake it with the best of them. But then he has to go and say, without grumbling. You know what that is. That's like in the heart. Uh, about a year ago, Sam Chan came and spoke, and he goes, this is how Christians cuss. <sighs> and I was like, man, you got me on that one. Because I can be hot, hot, show hospitality and be kind, but then inside you're like, what a jerk, you know? <laughs> but then a lot of things that Jesus asks us to do, a lot of things we learn, it's, it's an activity that we do, we participate in, and then allows the Holy Spirit to take it deeper. Because it's hard to serve on the outside for long without your heart coming along. <laughs> and um, the Holy Spirit is asking us to be kind. You know, uh, it's funny, kindness doesn't seem like a powerful spiritual weapon, but it is a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness. You know, it seems like what you'd see on a bumper sticker or a poster, you know, do random acts of kindness. <laughs> But uh, it might just be the gesture of serving that is just what someone needs. Um, that word, that effort, that expression of kindness, it's about serving one another. And he goes on to say in the next verse, 1 Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. I was talking with Holly uh, recently, and she threw out this term, uh, compassion fatigue. And I was like, is that even a thing? So I Googled it. And uh, if Wikipedia is true, it, it is a thing, compassion fatigue. And my understanding of it is that we get 24-hour news, we get instant news on cell phones and social media and we know about those people who don't have clean water to drink about the girls that are being sexually trafficked the marriages that are breaking down the homeless problem unemployment we know about all these things and then we get kind of numb to it it's just like you know the tornado victims and the hurricane and the earthquake and we're just like yep and isis and, and then it's like compassion fatigue and to me, that's one of those vital signs, like the pulse. There's a, there's a scripture, I didn't prepare it to show you, but it was like it, the scripture that says, don't close up your heart to the poor. So you don't want to develop indifference, this numbness to the need. And s serving people and serving the needs helps us keep that heart of Christ alive where we see people not as an interruption or a distraction, but a way that we can be a blessing and we can be a strength. And in verse 11, he says, if anyone serves, they should do with the strength God provides. So I want to close now. We're, we're uh, out of time here for this message today, but I want to close with letting you know that the enemy would like you to not follow through with these vital signs. And by the enemy, I mean the devil. I mean demonic forces that would try to attack you or deceive you or seduce you in some way and the works of the enemy that Jesus talked about. And even Peter said in 1 Peter 4.13, he said, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you 
as though some strange thing were happening. So I want to say, don't give up. Don't give up. Of course things will happen. Of course the enemy will come against you. Of course relationships will break down. But here's the takeaway today. Be relentless in your following of the word of God. Be passionate about your prayer and your worship to God. Stay connected with him. Be relentless in your love for people. Be relentless in how we serve because Jesus said, I'm a servant and I'm calling you to serve. If we're following him, we've got to serve and serve with that heart. And it's those times when things go sideways and things get challenging that we let some of these key vital signs go. And I wanna encourage you today, this is the day to intensify your faith, intensify your passion in serving him and in loving Jesus. Because no matter what you're facing, no matter what you've been through, it's not big enough to stop what God wants to do in you. Your salvation is a great gift and there's a mission that you've got from him to fulfill. God, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and I thank you for your presence here. And I pray for every soul, every mind, that you would bring healing, that you would bring freedom, that you would bring refreshing, revitalization of our heart and soul. Give us a hunger for your word. Give us understanding of your word. Speak to our life. Where there was no faith, let faith multiply. I pray that these next 21 days of prayer will be a blessing in such a tangible, specific way in the lives of people in our church. People here in this room that we would be hearing from heaven, that we would see changes of circumstances and life for people as we pray. God, I pray for the healing of broken hearts the encouragement of those who are discouraged and burdened down. Teach us the unforced rhythms of grace 